Hey, what's going on everyone? It's Alwyn here with another video. Hope you guys are all having a wonderful day as always. So today we're going to be going over Jim Cramer's Mad Money from March 26th, which was Friday the 26th. Okay, so let's get right into it, taking a look at it here. As always, make sure that you guys do subscribe to ActionLotusPlus.com. It's a great service. And then also Jim Cramer's Re Real Money column, which he posts on every morning. Okay, so let's get into it. Friday's market was a pretty green day overall, right? We'll get right into it here. Dow was up. The Dow Jones was up 1.39%, around 450 points. The S&P was up 1.66%, and the NASDAQ was up 1.24%. Okay, so every sector essentially saw a ton of buying, except, you know, our hot and expensive tech stocks that are trading at 100 times sales, right? Those are the ridiculous stocks, but we know that our great reopening plays are doing really, really well, right? So let's just jump right into the buy, sell, and holds here for the video. Uh, so what you guys can see, again, same as always, we're still looking at our cyclical plays here is what you really want to get into still your banks, your industrials, you know, those type of companies, those great reopening boom and bust stocks, right? couple of companies that he did list out here for us to kind of, you know, for, for you know, he listed as buys would be Borg, uh, Borg Warner. Then he also said AbbVie on the call. He also said Renewable Energy Group as some good names to look at, you know, to possibly buy. Some holds were 3D Systems. Uh, PayPal was another hold. Obviously, we've been over this a lot in terms of you know what to sell we're trying to sell tech into profit right trim some of your tech and it's gonna be important i'm gonna get to something later that might really hurt tech and even these boom and bust stocks then we have growth spacs you know try to trim these into profit as always especially the spacs and then he went into marathon oil uh, which would be a good sell here yeah it has had a little run up you know because oil prices are going up but he thinks it's a good place to sell Activision Blizzard, he wouldn't recommend that. He said that he prefers Take-Two Interactives, but keep in mind that people are going out, right? This is a great reopening. People want to leave their houses. They don't want to you know, continue to play COD, right? They don't want to play Call of Duty, right? And then Annalee uh, was another one, Annalee Capital that came on. They have you know, a very, very attractive 10%, 10.5% dividend yield. Guys, those companies, you got to be very, very, you know, very, very, you know, kind of careful because they try to keep high dividends in order to attract a lot of the newer investors. You know, some of the REITs, yeah, they do have legal things in place where they have to pay out X amount of their profits as a dividend. But we just got to be careful with this company. This was definitely a sell. Don't go close is what Kramer said. In terms of the game plan for the week is what we'll get to here. First, let's jump into kind of the market on Friday. He, you know, he started off asking, where are the sellers? You know, where do the sellers go? Having a wonderful green day where even the tech heavy NASDAQ was on the rise over, you know, 1.24%. So it's pretty big news. Uh, well, how he looks at it is that now we have over 200 and US will at least receive 240 million vaccines by this next week, which is huge. And now we are vaccinating over 3.4 million roughly people every day, or that was the high as of Friday, which is just like huge because that's almost 1% or, you know, it's around 1% of the US population each day. This is way surpassed, you know, Biden, President Joe Biden, what he, you know, wanted 100 million vaccines in his first 100 days. Under promiser, over deliver, right? That's always what we want to see. So that's really good. So the great reopening is really kicking in huge here, right? The reopening play is pretty much pulling up everything. But in terms of the younger investors, as I have listed here, we're starting to see a lot of the younger investors go to the sidelines now, right? We hear them talking about NFTs a lot, right? A lot of these Robinhood guys have kind of gone away because their classical growth, you know, high growth stocks with little to no earnings aren't doing too well in a boom and bust economy, which is getting very, very strong at this time. So Jim Cramer's game plan, what to kind of look forward going into this week here ahead of us. Uh, first thing on Monday, we have some labor uh, labor issues, right? So China labor issues has been huge. We know this with Nike, we know this with H&M, right? They've been accused of, you know, forced child labor, or sorry, forced labor in general, uh, and just slammed, you know, with everything regarding human rights. So we're gonna have to kind of see how that plays out. H&M, you know, has just been completely taken away from the PRC, People's Republic of China. Uh, and Nike could face a similar problem. And keep in mind, Nike and Apple are pretty heavy in China. Um, and just in general, the relationship with China that we thought would come back after President Trump may not go to normal as soon as possible. Right, Amazon, you know, they have their union, which will be reaching their conclusion, and they're voting on that process right now. As of Tuesday, what do we have? We have McCormick, right, uh, seasoning stock. Uh, but essentially what they are is that they kind of have two parts to their business models, how we like to think about it, right? 
one part will give, you know, uh, they give their products to restaurants, right? And obviously that part of their business is booming, right? That's where they're making a lot of money. It's doing very well. But the stock has also another side of the business, which is the consumer business, right? And this has to do more with the stay at home economy. When people are at home, you know, because of the pandemic, they don't want to go outside and things like that. They're cooking at home. But now everybody's frustrated of cooking at home. They just want to go outside and not worry about it. So we'll have to wait and see until Tuesday to kind of see how this, oops, how this, you know, um, McCormick uh, stock will kind of react. Um, and will it be considered a great reopening play, a boom and bust play, or not necessarily. So we'll have to wait and see for that. And then we have PVH here. Um, this was, you know, a victim of the pandemic and they are more, you know, as people are saying it's their time to shine now, more of a reopening play. And then we have Lululemon, which has done very well through the pandemic. And this is more of a stay at home thing. When people aren't outside, you know, they're wearing their Lululemon clothing per se. And then we have Chewy comes out on Thursday too. Everybody's looking at Ryan Cohn. He's always the focus of the show. And then we have Blackberry here, the Reddit, Wall Street bets, you know, short squeeze stocks. Jim Cramer says there is no appeal here. Okay, stay away from these companies for sure. Um, on Wednesday, what we see is we see Walgreens. So Walgreens did have a new CEO uh, or they got a new CEO. And this is from, she's from, that lady's from Starbucks actually. She was the COO. And this was, you know, kind of disappointing that she left. But we will have to see, you know, what she kind of says on the first conference call and kind of see whether or how they're going to be boosting their sales for the year. Micron would be the next one. In terms of Micron, you know, they are doing good in both their business lines their numbers should go up substantially, but the stock has already priced that in here. Uh, and then David Busters is, you know, stock taker symbol play. They will react very well no matter what. They're up 500%, believe it or not, from $10 to almost $50, you know, roughly over a year. So, it's, you know, they've had a big, big run there, you know, over the last year, but they still have room to run because it's an obvious reopening play, just like Darden Restaurant, right? And then we have Kroger here. A lot of people are kind of confused. Isn't it a lockdown because people want to get their groceries, cook at home, not go outside? Or, you know, but the stock kind of trades as, you know, a reopening place. So which one is it? Jim Cramer says it's more of the stock and we'll have to see uh, on this earnings call on Wednesday there. For Thursday, what do we have? We have CarMax. CarMax is going to be coming out. This is very important. Why? Because we know about the semi shortage, right? We know that, you know, semiconductor shortage is causing shortage of production of vehicles affecting Ford around one to $2 billion. So pretty big deal. And just in general, the supply of these autom uh, uh, automobiles in a very, very strong automotive market is limited, right? So everybody's kind of turning over to CarMax and Jim Cramer says this will be the best quarter of this week, at least that we're going to hear from. Uh, so CarMax, definitely keep an eye out for that. And then a couple of pointers here is that, you know, the first quarter is coming to an end. Q1 is coming to an end first three months. And then what do we know? There are going to be some last minute buyers. Why the IRS tax has been pushed back or the tax season has been pushed back to May. And at the same time, we're getting stimulus checks, which is huge. So a lot of this money might be poured into the markets. And that's what, you know, where we're going to start to see, you know, some of this uptrend, especially in the great reopening plays. Uh, and then we know that real, uh, sorry, the retail, retail will always thrive, right? We know the names Costco, Walmart, and, um, and we said Shopify. Right, Costco, Walmart, Shopify, based on the charts for multiple years, they tend to thrive during that Easter kind of week, the Easter holiday. So get into those plays if you want to do a trade there. Uh, you know, retail does, you know, over the past, it does seem to thrive. Okay, uh, So that's kind of what Kramer went into there. Then his executive decision was Borg Warner. In terms of Borg Warner, uh, what are they? They're an automaker, okay? And they kind of got left behind last year. Why? Because of the lack of EV exposure, okay? So they had a huge lack of EV exposure. How big? Well, only 3% of their sales were went to EV, right? So only 3% EV sales, which is very, very limited. Their main focus is on engine components and things like drivetrain, okay? So kind of things that are going out of uh, fashion. So they're kind of getting forced into this market if they want to be still relevant in today's picture, right? But now they are trying to change this. That's really good. What do we know? Well, they have 25% is what they're going for of their sales by 2025 to be EV focused, right? Uh, to be EV sales. And then 45% of those sales will be EV by 2030. So some pretty big goals that they're going for there. What's really important is that they only trade at 11 times earnings. So this is the stock 
that people want to earn, uh, sorry, people want to own in these great reopening boom and bust plays, right? People are looking for stocks that are down, even though this is up 25% year to date. People are looking for cheap stocks that have a lot of upside potential. Now people are more focused on the price to earning ratio, price to book ratio, you know, EBITDA and things like that, right? People are more focused there and are trying to get heavily discounted stocks that have a lot more re realistic, I should say, room to run. Uh, and then they had another Delphi acquisition or Delphi acquisition, which is pretty big because it gives them scale, especially for uh, things like software and electronics. They are looking for, you know, a change in strategy, ob obviously, right? They're going to a ton more EV sales, but this is going to be a gradual shift over time, right? But these numbers, I'm not going to lie, are pretty aggressive, right? So what do we know? Uh, they are going for a pretty profound, you know, shift towards EV. They're making this big pivot. Uh, and one important thing is that one of their customers, you know, Jim Cramer asked, uh, he said they're trying to work with everybody, right? So if it's a Fisker, if it's a SPAC, you know, trying to work with them, uh, you know, more speculative type of company, he's trying to work with them, maybe Lion Electric, something like that. Um, and he's also trying to work with the bigger guys, GM, Ford, and things like that, right? So his customers, he wants to keep it open to anybody. He, he's open to working with anybody. And one thing that I did like here is that he pointed out the, that the bus, the bus sector itself will be electrified very quickly, which I thought was interesting, especially for NGA, right? Lion Electric. Lion Electric. Uh, I know there were some trades there, especially for their buses that are going electric, and it's kind of a Biden play too. And then we know they have an $8 billion spending. Uh, between now, 2021 and 2025, uh, using their own funding, so they're self-funding it using their free cash flow. Uh, and essentially what this money is going towards is, you know, to acquiring, you know, good companies that are technologically advanced for efficiency and gaining scale. Okay, so the final thing is that they will pivot, right? They are, you know, they are getting more and more connected with the EVs, what Jim Cramer says. So definitely focus on Bork Warner, good company here. And then we went to KBR Inc. here. KBR is going to be a construction company. It is up 12% for the year, or I should say it said it's up 12% after the investor day, uh, which kind of blew everyone away in terms of what they were doing. What did they used to be? They used to be this energy service play, but you know, in 2014, when the price of crude just completely crashed, you know, thing, they changed their business model. Right, they started focusing on government sales. That's where 80% of their sales come from now. That's like their main customer, okay? Now they're kind of focused on sustainable technology, sustainable energy, and that's kind of where their focus has shifted. So they're helping companies now to achieve high ESG ratings, right, out of 10. And they also, one important thing to note is they did go carbon neutral a couple of years ago. Uh, we did see very, very bullish forecasts. They were saying that they're, you know, uh, they're uh, expecting to double or even triple their earnings here that by 2025. So very, very good growth there. And then they are invested in plastic recycling here, which is another big thing. And they're trying to, re you know, uh, recycle all types of plastic, you know, unrestrained. So all types of plastic is what they're looking there. They had some, you know, big franchises, $1 billion franchise. They built up to support Na uh, NASA and other things like that. And the biggest thing that I caught here was that they're the forefront of civilian space, you know, travel, directed energy, national security, and defense. So some pretty big markets there is what they're looking at. And one thing that I really liked was their green ammonia solution, which is essentially a less expensive way, uh, or I should say less expensive play than just pure green hydrogen by itself. And it's more practical why ammonia is a liquid, right? The chemical formula he says is NH3, right? So if it's a liquid, it can be transported a lot easier than hydrogen gas, right? Which is H2, which is obviously gas, like I said, right? So it's gonna be a lot harder, you know, to carry that around because it is combustible or highly combustible. And, you know, NH3 ammonia can be kind of used in order to, you know, uh, create renewable energy there. Uh, and then also, you know, he's thinking about producing, you know, what would be really cool in the future, producing you know, energy from air and water because uh, they have these components within, right? High, high nitrogen levels in the air or the atmosphere. So that was KBR Inc. there. And then in his no huddle offense, it was about inflation nation. Now, I suggest you guys all, if you're to watch anything, you know, definitely, definitely, definitely go to, you know, around the 55 minute mark is when he gets into his no huddle offense every day. Definitely check this one out. I want to spend some quality time here. So I think this one's very, very important topic to cover. Okay, he gets into this talk about inflation nation and kind of what's the problem here with inflation, right? For so long, we've been hearing that, okay, Jay Powell, Fed Chief Jay Powell, what is he saying? Well, he's saying that inflation, yes, it's going to happen, but it's going to be transitory, meaning that for short term, right? So inflation is going to be short lived. After we see some inflation, it's not going to be crossing our averages of two or 3%. 
we'll start to see inflation come back down and it'll stabilize over the longer term. But what Jim Cramer says now is that, you know, yes, it will in the bigger picture prove to be temporary, but he's now believing that this will, so it is temporary, yes, this will still be an issue, however, he's saying, okay? So we really gotta focus on this. So what's important is that, you know, talking about Powell here, we're gonna have to see, you know, you know Powell will have to kind of steal himself is what Kramer exactly says. Uh, when it comes to this quarter price, you know, inflation when it's revealed, right? Because we know the quarter just ended. So we want to see how the price inflation has been, right? Most likely inflation is going to heat up, you know, and this is going to continue to stay for at least a shorter term, right? But we know that Powell himself doesn't want to raise the rates. But, you know, keep in mind, we have this great reopening where the economy is so strong and we're throwing money through the stimulus checks, right? And then our taxis and IRS also push back. So we have essentially a lot of free, mar free money in the market. So he might be forced actually to tighten rates, okay? So this is what we wanna get into right now. Uh, and one big thing is that, you know, inflationary shortages are turning to become more, you know, intractable. What does that mean? They're just kind of becoming harder and harder to control. So let's get right into talking about these shortages that are, uh, you know, resulting in a lot of inflation. One example that came on, you know, Kramer show, I think Wednesday was very important, was Nucor. Right, Nucor stock has went up, I think, 10 to 12% since he came on Kramer's show. So very, very good stock there, Nucor. We talked about this in the past ago in my yesterday's video or day before yesterday. Uh, and then we talked about, you know, steel is their main thing, right? They're the number one US steel maker, right? What do we know about steel? What do we know about the company in general, I should say, is that they're looking for the, they're expecting the best quarter, right? This is the best quarter and the next quarter will be even better than this quarter, right? So we know that their demand is just on the rise and they're already increasing the price of steel. And keep in mind, like we talked about yesterday, uh, this is before the infrastructure deal. If the if $3 trillion infrastructure deal somehow does get passed, there will be even more demand from the federal government, right? This will send up prices even further and they're already launching prices as of now. So it's a pretty big deal that exists there, right? And then in terms of lumber, in terms of lumber, what do we know? Well, we know that, you know, Canada, you know, gets, uh, you know, transports most or import, uh, I should say exports most of the lumber to the US, but we have tariffs right now on Canadian lumber. So what does that mean? There's not enough supply right now to hold down the pricing of lumber. If we had more supply and we had tariff issues, it's okay because supply and demand, you know, lots of supply, you know, will, you know, keep prices down. But that's not the case because of these tariffs and we haven't reached an agreement yet. There is a shortage, at least a temporary shortage of lumber, which is causing lumber to double. And what does this mean? It becomes more and more expensive to build, you guessed it, homes. And are the, you know, builders going to take on those costs? No, thanks. The builders are going to send it to the customers, the people who are buying the houses. So at the end of the day, what do we see? We see a lot more inflation. Okay, it is short term. Why? Once they, you know, get that deal, once they come to a deal with Canada, once the agreement is reached regarding uh, tariffs, yeah, then lumber will start to fall down. But there is a transitory or you know kind of a shortage, you know, with inflation. Sorry, with inflation temporary, right? So lumber is another thing that we want to keep an eye on. Semiconductor shortage, right? We've been talking about this tremendously a lot. Uh, you know, this just continues to get worse and worse each day. It got so bad that Ford, right? Ford itself had to stop or halt the production of the F-150, US's most popular pickup truck for the weekend, right? And then people are turning now because it's so hard to get a hand on these trucks. They're turning now to buying used cars, used pickup trucks, right? But the prices for these are also expensive, right? So people are like, you know, well, used pickup trucks are also expensive. Used truck prices are expensive, you know? So that causes more and more inflation at the end of the day, right? And this is gonna force Powell to raise rates, you know, in one period of time, at least what we're thinking now. And then semiconductor companies, what are they doing? Well, they're taking advantage of the semi shortage and they're raising prices too. So what does this mean? There are going to be, you know, there's no uh, sign of near term boost in production. This will, you know, take, cause why? Cause it takes a long time to build a semiconductor factory. And that's one thing I wanna talk about. Right, we know that Intel, Intel, you know, we know Pat, you know, uh, he, he's been the new CEO at Intel. He's been talking about, you know, creating semiconductor, you know, factories. These take a long time and these are, you know, Jim Cramer says 2024 stories at earliest. Why? Well, if Intel wants to create their own factories within the US to build semiconductors, that takes a long time. Why? Where do they get their semiconductor machinery from? Well, it would be KLA Corporation, right? Applied Materials. What else do we have? Another one would be Lam Research, right? So these are the three stocks where, the, I mean, three companies where they can get their semiconductor machinery. Well, they're already backordered a ton with other companies, right? 
So just because Intel got a new CEO and he's trying to come in really fast, he can just, you know, jump ahead in line unless they let him, you know, jump ahead in line and just get his machinery and start producing very fast. The semiconductor shortage is around an 18 month issue here. And, it, you know, Intel, well, they're looking at starting, you know, semi production in 2024 at earliest. So this semi shortage is causing huge inflation that exists, right? Semi prices are going up. The actual retailers here, the people who are selling it are taking advantage of that. They don't want to lose margins. And then the cus customer is the one who has to bear the cost at the end of the day. Inflation, 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 right? What else do we see? We see this issue here with the petrochemicals. Why? Well, we know that the the Swiss uh, the Swiss Canal uh, got shut down because a container ship got jammed up there, which is causing again short term issues. But this is resulting in inflation. Why? Well, now petroleum products, you know, are going up in value. Why? Because tankers now travel all the way below South uh, Africa, so they have to go past below South Africa instead of like Egypt area. So they're taking a much longer route, which takes much more time. What does this lead to? Increased price. What does this lead to? Freight costs are just soaring like crazy, right? So that's gonna be another issue. The the Swiss Canal uh, is blocked, so that's causing you know shipping you know pressures on price and shipping, right? And then another problem here is winter storm Yuri, right? This is causing a huge issue with the petrochemical industry again, um, especially with plastics, right? Plastics are scarce, and because they're scarce, they're susceptible to radical price increases, right? Inflation. So plastic, you know. Uh, that rip is kind of beginning to hit, you know, the end of the retail businesses, right? So Jim Cramer about one thing that I liked a lot, he talked about Home Depot, right? When somebody went to Home Depot, I think this was in Texas, they looked at, you know, they, they you know, they looked at the, the electrical, you know, kind of, uh, you know, devices, right? And then they were or electrical parts, I should say. They went there and what did they realize? Well, there was a short of PVC pipes. They were short of, you know, plastic coated wires. They were short of excuse me, plastic electrical box, uh, boxes, right? And the retailers, like, it was cleared. It was cleared on the shelves of Home Depot, right? And why did this happen? Well, because plumbers and electricians are hearing about the shortage in plastic because of the super storm URI. And what are they doing? Because they want their business to continue. They're going to start buying these plastic goods up, right? These electrical equipment that have to do with plastic because they don't want a shortage. Because when they're in business, you want to make sure you have all the supplies to continue running your business. And this is clearing the shelves of Home Depot. Well, think about Home Depot. Well, if plastic, you know, there's a shortage, they raise plastic rates. So is Home Depot just gonna bear the cost, reduce their margins? No, they're gonna keep their margins the same. In order to do that, they raise the prices. So that's inflation right there. Who bears the cost? The consumers bear the cost, right? So Home Depot is doing great because of the inflation, but the consumer is having to bear the cost again of this inflation. So Jerome Powell, again, it comes back to him. He's gonna be forced at one point to increase rates, right? That's kind of the situation we're in because of all these transitory issues. Bottom line here is with the exception of the semi shortage, which is a longer term issue, 18 months, remember that. Um, what are we gonna see? This will be proved to, this will prove to be transitory. The only issue, the only issue, which is the biggest issue is that we don't have enough time, right? Higher rates, you know, if he does, Jerome Powell, Fed Chief Jerome Powell does raise rates, it only hurts the economy and especially the boom and bust stocks. And there's gonna be a loss of jobs that comes at a cost. Hopefully you guys all enjoyed the video and learned something new. I thank you all so much for your continued support. Make sure to drop a like on the video if you enjoy. Subscribe to my channel if you're new. Turn on those post notifications so that we are aware of when I do upload my next video. Comment down below. Till next time. Peace.